my particular pleasure to welcome our chief guest to the, to the afternoon up to the lectern to deliver his address. Uh, may I please invite the Lord Ahmed of Wimbledon, Minister of State for the Commonwealth, the United Nations and South Asia from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office to the lectern to deliver his address. Well, thank you for that introduction, although I must admit, when that backdrop appeared, I had a brief identity crisis as a who I was, where I was, and was I in the right place, which partly is a reflection of the challenge of any minister, and particularly mine as a minister of state at the Foreign Office. Um, the High Commissioner, who I know so well, just said to me, thank you for coming. Um, I think it's a great uh, scheduling feat on the behalf of my private office that managed to get <coughs> me here on time, notwithstanding the protests uh, which are currently taking, which sees Whitehall come to a real standstill. I, there was a visiting delegation who asked me, actually with all the other backdrop of what's happening in the United Kingdom, is it not great to see the fact that democracy is flourishing. And I said, absolutely. I mean, no longer do I have to check left and right every time I cross from the Foreign Office to go over to Parliament to check if there's a taxi sort of aiming to knock me down. Um, on the contrary, we have a very sedate and calm environment uh, with people putting up mark, uh, small little tents and little fires and everything. So uh, it's an interesting sort of scenario which is being played out in Westminster. But an important issue um, which was also part of my recent visit to Sri Lanka on the importance of uh, climate change. And I will come on to that in a moment or two. But let me start with, first and foremost, thanking you all. Thanking you all, first of all, to bear with me. I know there's been a bit of a chop and change of the schedule, but that's reflection of the challenge of my own schedule. But I'm delighted to be back here in London from a recent visit to both India, but also to Sri Lanka. I'm also particularly delighted to join you, Minister, uh, and uh, work through some of the incredible collaboration we've already seen between our two countries, but also the potential opportunities which lie ahead. And in this regard, I'm particularly delighted to see, I would say my friend, but he's so much more than a friend. I'm referring to Lord Sheikh. Lord Sheikh is someone I've known many, many years. Um, I suppose in a previous life, I would call him uncle, but I call him by now. He is my elder, who I respect greatly. Lord Sheikh, it's lovely to be here with you as well. But in particular, if I may, Minister, with your permission, seek to highlight a particular friend of mine, who is actually one of yours, but she's also one of ours. She is, of course, the High Commissioner to the Court of St. James, and I'm referring to my dear friend, Manisha. She has been an exemplary ambassador advocate for Sri Lanka. But more importantly, she is incredible in the strengthening of bonds and relationships. I remember, <laughs> I remember our first meeting, which was on Independence Day, which was in real color. That day, Manisha and I actually coordinated ties and saris to the same effect. I leave you to guess who was wearing the sari and who was wearing the tie. Uh, but nevertheless, that coordination was reflection of what lay ahead. I was also there with Manisha when the tragic Easter attacks took place. And I'm delighted equally. That's why I pointed towards Lord Sheikh. I know he's done some incredible work in this sphere. But I feel passionate about this. Here we are in the United Kingdom, a community which is defined by its strength of its communities, its diversities. As I was in India just now, and someone said to me, well, don't you face challenges in the UK? And do communities get a voice? I said, who would have thought a conservative-led government, admittedly by someone called Johnson, would also have within his government Patel, Javed, Suna, and the name goes on, Sharma, and dare I say it, Ahmed as well. This is a reflection of the diversity of our country, but also about the opportunities which are extending, extended to every community, which makes it the place it is. Therefore, when we saw those devastating attacks, we were also encouraged by the response, the response of the communities, which didn't turn on each other, which actually said the best response to those who seek to divide us is to show, not just through words alone, but through our actions, unity. Therefore, I was particularly honored to lay flowers at one particular site at the Catholic Church, which was one of the targets of those bombings, but also to show that sense of unity between communities, between cultures and faiths, but also to stand in unity at this important time with Sri Lanka. And Manisha, I know you were keen 
for me to get over to Sri Lanka at the earliest opportunity. Well, I, I think I'd only been a minister responsible for South Asia in a matter of weeks, and I know there are elections uh, pending. So I was very keen to ensure that the first window I got to go to Sri Lanka, I got there. That's not saying that people didn't make it hard. Um, I'm not going to quote which airline, but I did fly through Dubai, and I had an unscheduled eight-hour stopover in Dubai, which wasn't catered for, which meant I only had literally 22 hours on the ground in your beautiful country. But within those 22 hours, it was incredible what I saw and the people I met. Sri Lanka and the United Kingdom share an important bond, and we're enriched, I referred earlier, to the diversity that defines us here in the UK. That diversity is reflected in the rich Sri Lankan diaspora, who we claim very much as our own, British Sri Lankans, people who have Sri Lankan heritage but are contributing to every facet and every part and sector of British life today. And we are also partners in a growing range of sectors, be it trade, tourism, and education. But it's those people links which matter the most. And I saw that directly when I was in Colombo. I met representatives from a broad cross-section of society. The first person I met was the president of Sri Lanka. He kindly invited me to his home rather than his office, which is always a good sign for a visiting minister in terms of the warmth and strength of the relations we have. I also took the weather with us because it was absolutely bucketing down with rain when we, invited in Sri when we arrived in Sri Lanka. But nevertheless, it was a sign again of a common heritage we have in weather, I suppose. But I met politicians, I met faith leaders, and importantly, I also met business people and the youth of Sri Lanka. I met an incredible organization called Sri Lanka Unites which brings together people of all communities and backgrounds looking at what the future of Sri Lanka should be, how communities can come together, looking at the skills which are required for the Sri Lanka of 2019 and beyond. And I was really struck by the energy and drive amongst all of them to build a prosperous future for their country. And I assure you, in my 22 hours on the ground, I needed some of that energy and drive myself. But my message to them and them to me was that the UK and Sri Lanka has a quite unique partnership. But we need to also do so much more to play a part in those young people who shared with me their thoughts, their ambitions, to realize what those aspirations and how those could be delivered and achieved. We see Sri Lanka, we, I came in part, part way through the last uh, presentation. It is a vi vibrant emerging trading hub at the heart of an increasingly important region. As I sat in the departure lounge of Colombo Airport en route to Delhi, I met with a leading member of the airport team. As a former aviation minister, I was intrigued to hear he was heading out to the north of the country. Often we hear about investments around a particular country, but the opening up of an extended runway to ensure that, again, connectivity to the south of India is also made that much more easier. And this infrastructure investment is key to the future of Sri Lanka. And that is why we in the UK believe absolutely, I heard one here, here, there, that was good. We need a few more of those. But <laughs> thank you, Lord Sheikh. But equally, that's why we need so much more. The United Kingdom recently within that region, and Maldives is a near neighbor, has, during the time when the Prime Minister was Foreign Secretary, embarked on a very extensive program to open up new posts. Because it's not just good enough about talking about these things, it's also about what we do on the ground. And I'm delighted that we will be opening a new embassy in the Maldives very shortly. And the association between both Sri Lanka and Maldives on the issue of trade, on the issue of climate change, is going to be very important. And indeed, I said I wish to touch on climate change. Some of you may have followed that the Prime Minister during High Level Week at the UN General Assembly announced an extra ex excess of 11 billion pounds of climate finance. Now, this also extends to how we can strengthen partnerships in these areas. When you look around the shores of our country here in the UK, and yes, we are an island nation, we have gained much from the fact that when it comes to offshore wind, we have one of the biggest projects going. It's about how we can come together in these projects so they don't benefit just one economy or one country, but how we can collaborate in ensuring that we work for the world as a whole. 
And when you look towards Sri Lanka, you see a middle-income country with a growing economy. Trade and investment between the UK and Sri Lanka grew to 1.3 billion pounds last year. That trajectory is just now going up, and that's good, and that is doing so. It's steadily rising. And indeed, when you look at the World Bank's ease of doing business rankings, Sri Lanka is rising up the ranks there as well. We already have a strong import and export record in cars. And I saw those on the road of Colombo. We saw the same traffic as you do in London, if not at times more challenging. But nevertheless, they were there and present. But equally, we've seen a strong growth in business in the sector of textiles. And crucially, let's not forget tea. That sort of defines us here in the UK, but let's not forget where tea is sourced from. But moving away from that, I've already alluded to one sector within the green economy and climate change, but there are new opportunities in sectors as diverse as technology, finance, infrastructure, energy I've touched on, but also education. The recent announcement by the UK government of extending the stay for students studying in the UK for two years after graduation, I think is a real positive step and we want to ensure we leverage that for the benefit of the next generation. And I'm also delighted that so many UK businesses and investors, many represented right here in this room, are here today to explore those very opportunities. I'm sure you have a very thought-provoking, inspiring session that lies ahead. And I hope you do go away from today with a new appreciation of the immense opportunities on the offer from Sri Lanka, but also importantly of Sri Lanka's real potential as a hub for business in the wider region. The ambition is there, the aspiration is there, the hope from the next generation is there and present. And for our part from the UK, representatives here in London and in the region will do all we can to advise you and help you. We've ex extended our prosperity team on the ground in Colombo at our High Commission, and we need to do so much more. Therefore, Minister, High Commissioner, and to every business represented here, we stand with Sri Lanka through times of good and times of challenge. But equally, we stand with Sri Lanka in building that hope, that prosperity for a joint future between our two nations, which I absolutely believe with great passion will go from strength.